What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel we're going to be checking out the Rolex Sea Dweller, the SD43, or the 50th Anniversary Sea Dweller. A lot of people have been asking me to review this watch and I was finally able to get one in on loan. We're going to jump over the tabletop here in a minute, we're going to review this watch, talk about the pros and the cons, and compare it to the Rolex Submariner. We're going to try to answer the question, which Rolex dive watch is the best dive watch? But before we do that, a couple of things real quick. Number one, I am a uh, member and moderator of a new Facebook group that was just started by myself and some friends called Just Rolex. It's a discussion group centered around Rolex watches and only Rolex watches. If you're interested in joining the discussion, come on over to Facebook and join the Just Rolex Facebook group. There'll be a link down in the description below. Number two, big thanks to my friends over at Exquisite Timepieces for loaning me this watch from their pre-owned inventory. If you're not familiar with Exquisite Timepieces, they work with my channel quite a bit. They've loaned me a number of watches and they are a fantastic watch dealer. They're an authorized dealer of over 50 different watch brands in the Naples, Florida area, and they do have a brick and mortar store, which is outstanding. Rolex is not one of the brands that they are an authorized dealer of, but they have an extensive pre-owned inventory and plenty of Rolex watches in the pre-owned inventory to choose from. I really do encourage you to go over to their website, exquisitetimepieces.com, and if you happen to call them up and talk watches, get a hold of Evan, Tim, Chris, or any of the guys over at Exquisite Timepieces, and let them know that you heard about their store from Guy and the Just Bluefish Watch channel. Now, without any further ado, let's dive over to the tabletop. Let's take a look at the Sea Dweller. Let's talk about the features and specifications, the pros and cons of the watch, and of course, let's compare it to the Rolex Submariner and try to decide which of the two is the best Rolex dive watch. All right, here we have it, guys. We have the Rolex Sea Dweller 126600, often referred to as the SD43 because it's a 43 millimeter case, sometimes referred to as the 50th anniversary Sea Dweller, but nevertheless, a watch with many nicknames, it is in fact the current generation ceramic Sea Dweller. Really happy to have had this watch here on loan to finally do a review on it. I really have been waiting a long time. I guess technically this has been on the market for two years now. And yeah, just super happy to have it here. Now, first things first, we'll go over this watch. We'll do a review of it. We'll talk about the features, the specifications. I'll give you my overall impressions of the watch by itself. But then towards the middle of this video, we're gonna compare this watch. And what are we gonna compare it to? Well, of course, we're gonna compare it to the Rolex Submariner. I've gotten asked many times since doing my original Submariner review videos by viewers of the channel, should I buy a Submariner or should I buy a Sea Dweller? Well, we're gonna compare these two watches. I'm gonna let you know what I think about them side by side in terms of both features and aesthetics and style. I'll give you my opinions on the debate between which is really the better Rolex dive watch to own or to have in a collection. But before we do that, we'll just talk about the Sea Dweller by itself for a while. Now before we jump into the features and specifications and the overall review of this watch, a little bit of history about the Sea Dweller. It was debuted in 1967 as reference number 1665, and it, that reference number ran for about a decade. After that reference number, another one came out, and then another, and then another. I'm not going to talk about all of those. What I want to talk about are the more relevant and recent versions of the Sea Dweller, and uh, kind of look at them as, you know, how they relate to this specific model. In particular, I want to talk about the 40 millimeter versions that came before this. In 1989 through 2009, we had the pre-ceramic model, reference 16600. We call it pre-ceramic because this model has a ceramic bezel on it, and the pre-ceramic models had uh, aluminum bezel inserts. Now, that pre-ceramic model that I'm talking about was a 40 millimeter case diameter watch. It was very similar, more so than this watch, to the Submariner, at least in my opinion. I think in a lot of people's opinions. Now, the funny thing about the 40 millimeter pre-ceramic Sea Dweller, 
A 40 millimeter Sea Dweller has been in the product catalog ever since inception, but when that watch was discontinued in 2009, there was a void. There was no 40 millimeter Sea Dweller in Rolex's product catalog. We did have the Deep Sea. The Deep Sea Sea Dweller came out in 2008 and has been in production ever since. But that is a, a much bigger, bigger watch, again at 44 millimeters in case diameter. So that void of having no standard model Sea Dweller went for about five years. Then in 2014, the reference 116600 was introduced. That was the first ceramic Sea Dweller and not a particularly popular watch. It's funny, that watch was only in production for about three years, and it was discontinued in 2017. And while it didn't sell very good when it was in production, secondary or secondhand pre-owned market prices jumped significantly on that watch. I guess people recognized that it was an underloved model or reference, and they expected it to be a collector's item because so few were sold over such a short uh, production run. Nevertheless, that 40 millimeter ceramic Sea Dweller was discontinued and replaced with the model that we have here today. Again, this model being reference 126600. A couple of key big differences between this and the prior generation model are the size. This is 43 millimeters in case diameter. Also on the crystal, you can see we have a Cyclops magnifier. The first time a Sea Dweller was able to be fitted with the Cyclops magnifier over the date. And certainly a big point of contention for a lot of Rolex fans and enthusiasts as well as collectors that preferred the Sea Dweller to be sans Cyclops magnifier. The problem with that is that, uh, in my mind anyway, it just doesn't feel like a Rolex without the Cyclops. I'm a big fan of it. I'm glad they did add it to this watch. I suppose the reason that it had been vacant from the crystal for so long is just that the, uh, the technology wasn't there to properly adhere the Cyclops magnifier to the crystal and still achieve the fantastic depth ratings that this watch does achieve. So there's a little bit of history about the Sea Dweller, in particular how this, this model that we have here relates to the more recent models of the last uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, a lot of people do love this watch and they prefer it to those pre-SD43 or 50th anniversary models. I'm not entirely sure for myself, but this is an impressive watch nonetheless. Let's talk features, specifications, we'll talk about the measurements on this watch. Basic stuff, of course we have sapphire crystal, we have a, a ceramic bezel insert which is a platinum PVD filled with the uh, graduations and markers. We are wearing a 904L oyster style case with a 904L matching oyster bracelet. The bracelet terminates into the oyster clasp, which does feature glide lock extension. We'll look at all of those things up close. We do have the trip lock crown, as you would imagine, the crown guards on the side of the case. The dial is uh, beautifully applied with chroma, uh, excuse me, chromolite luminescence for uh, excellent uh, glow in the dark visibility. Overall, all of the features and specifications that you would expect from a professional Rolex dive watch. The first thing we're going to talk about when we talk about features on this watch will be the new movement. This watch uses the 3235 Rolex movement and the movement I think maybe technically was first introduced in Rolex solid gold or precious metal date just before it made it into any of their sports watches but it is again a relatively new movement it was new for this specific model in 2017. things about the new movement that really excite people 70 hour power reserve that's probably the biggest tangible difference that you would notice as an end user prior generation 3135 movements of course were 48 hours this movement is obviously 28,800 vibrations per hour of a beat rate it's a superlative chronometer so it should have an accuracy range of plus or minus two seconds per day and as you would expect it is an automatic winding with manual wind and of course stop seconds hacking this features all of the hallmarks of a high quality rolex movement including the paramagnetic blue parachrome hairspring and uh, high performance paraflex shock absorbers within the movement overall 
This is, in theory, an excellent movement. I'll say that I'm a little bit leery when it comes to being an early adopter of new technology. So I want to see how the new generation of movements work over the next, say, five years before I really give it my personal seal of approval and you know start throwing my money into these new watches. All sorts of little things can pop up. This watch is 90%, or I should say the movement, 90% new parts versus the older 3135. A lot has changed with it. Of course, it uses the new Chronergy escapement, and when compared to the old style Swiss lever escapement, it is supposed to be 15% more efficient. The mainspring barrel is totally reprofiled. It's a much thinner walled mainspring barrel with a much longer mainspring. That's how we get, in part anyway, that extra 70 hours of power reserve. Another big difference with this movement, its monoblock rotor is on ball bearings as compared to a uh, jeweled bushing system. And the the old jeweled bushing system that you find in the 3135 movement is time-tested and true, but there were some small quirks about it as I understand it. It would potentially, if not properly lubricated, get more wear and tear because the rotor's shaft that interfaces with the jewel, the jewel is much harder than the metal of the shaft of the rotor, or maybe it's the sleeve of the bushing, but regardless, that could potentially wear out faster than you would want or prefer, and in the process of wearing, kind of pulverize itself into dust and really put a lot of dirt and debris within the movement. So that was maybe one small downside of the older 3130 movement, in theory, based on reports that I've read anyway. This new movement, though, with the uh, ball bearing system on the rotor, shouldn't have that issue, but I will say that I have noticed in the few 3135 based watches that I've handled that it's a noisier movement. You can really hear that rotor spinning away inside the watch. It's, you know, you feel the swish of the rotor when you're moving the watch around. I, I noticed it especially in a uh, two-tone date just reference uh, 116233 if I'm not mistaken. You could really feel the rotor just whipping around inside of there. Whereas on my older version Submariner watch with the 3135, the, the movement is dead silent. You don't feel or hear any sort of movement whatsoever with the rotor. All that said, this is in theory an excellent movement. And again, after I see that it's been in implemented and you know running reliably for the majority of users that are early adopters and i expect that it will be i'm sure that i'd be more than happy to jump into any watch with this movement overall dimensions of this watch it is a Pretty big watch. <laughs> let's let's not uh, mince words here. Case diameter 43 millimeters in and of itself, not huge. Lots of watches come in at 42 to 44 millimeters, in particular dive watches. But we have 22 millimeter lug width where the bracelet attaches to the case. More significantly, we have a thickness that comes in at about 15 and a half millimeters thick, and you can see that case back protruding out of the mid case pretty significantly. Finally, we have a wingspan from one edge of the case to the other from tip to tip of 50.5 millimeters. That is a really long lug to lug width or wingspan, longer than I prefer on a watch for my six and three quarter inch wrist if I'm being perfectly honest. So this watch wears tall on the wrist, it wears long on the wrist because of the thickness and the overall wingspan. In my opinion, I think that anyone under, for sure, my size wrist, six and three quarter, I would say maybe anyone under seven inches probably should think about investing in uh, this particular model. You know, if you like bigger watches, that's one thing, that's fine. But I wouldn't buy one sight unseen without trying it on first if I was on the smaller side or spectrum of wrist sizes. It is a pretty big watch on the wrist. It has a ton of presence. 
is probably the way that I would put it. A couple of other measurements I want to touch on. Well, I said that this is a 22 millimeter lug width bracelet, it tapers down pretty significantly. Down here at the bottom, the final links come in at a measurement of about 17 millimeters, and then they step up slightly on the clasp to 19 millimeters wide. I bring that up because we're going to compare the overall size and taper of the bracelet on this watch to the Submariner a little bit later in the video. Uh, but yeah, significant amount of taper on this bracelet, like pretty much all Rolex Oyster bracelets for that matter. The Oyster case, of course, features a screw-down crown with trip lock. You can see the three dots on the bottom or underside of the Coronet logo on the crown, signifying that this is, in fact, a trip lock crown. Trip lock does aid in the waterproofness of this watch. Speaking of which, you can see on the dial, the waterproofness is 4,000 feet or 1,220 meters, significantly more waterproof than the Submariner, or most watches for that matter. This is uh, highly depth rated. Now, the crown feels absolutely excellent. I love the knurling on Rolex crowns. The size is perfect. The crown guards don't interfere with uh, manipulating the crown. Getting it out to the first position to hand wind, super simple. I'll say that hand winding this 32-35 movement feels different than hand winding a 31-35. You can tell it's not the same movement. You can tell that there's a lot different inside the watch. It just has a little bit of a different feel. Of course, you can pull it out to the first position to quick set the date, pull the crown out to the second position to stop the movement to set your time. Screwing the crown back in, just a little bit of downward pressure, and giving it a spin, seats it back down to the case to re-secure that uh, 1,220 meters of water resistance. Uh, yeah, overall the crown on Rolex watches are just outstanding. Some of the best. This one is, of course, no exception. And looking at the rest of the case, like I had mentioned, 904L stainless steel, the finishing is excellent, high mirrored polish on the flanks, brushing on the tops or the hoods of the lugs, overall excellent high quality finishing, Rolex always does their finishing well. You'll also notice that there's a helium escape valve on the uh, 9 o'clock side of the case. In my opinion, a perfectly useless feature for this watch. And I know people will argue with me. I had mentioned the uselessness of the helium escape valve on the Omega Seamaster as well in my prior review. I just don't believe that there are many, and maybe even any, saturation divers that are using this type of watch for, for their work. Uh, it's, it's a profession. People don't saturation dive for leisure. That's not an activity that the average Joe is ever going to do. And I think a lot of people are confused with what saturation diving really is because I've had people argue with me that, oh, it's necessary if you're going to go saturation diving. Saturation diving is like living in, an, in a compressed chamber underwater for weeks and weeks at a time breathing in a mixture of oxygen and helium while you're in that compressed chamber. And then as you're being decompressed over a long period of time, it allows that helium to escape without popping your crystal out. But that's not an activity that the average Joe will ever do. I, there's probably only a handful, handful of human beings on the planet that do that activity. And I suspect that very few, if any of them, would ever wear a watch like this or a Seamaster while they were doing that job. I just don't think that we need this tool anymore, you know, it's it's just really not necessary. Now the upside is that it's not an eyesore on the flank of this case, like I feel that it is on a Omega Seamaster. On the Seamaster you have a large protruding valve coming off of the side of the case. At least in this case, it's not an eyesore, but it is obviously an added expense that if a person generally likes this watch but is never going to use that feature, they have to pay for regardless of whether or not they're going to use it. I think, uh, you know, it's just not a feature that I really need to see in watches, and I think 99.999999% of the people, whether or not they understand it, need they, they, they probably agree with me. That's, the, I guess, the point that I'm trying to get at.
So we'll get past that, okay? So we got the helium escape valve there, sure, whatever. The case though, overall, like I had mentioned, fit and finish is stunning, it's outstanding. One of the big things that I think people will probably hone in on on this Oyster case is the overall lug profile, and we're gonna focus in on that a lot when we compare this to the Submariner. A lot of people feel like the lug profile, the transition from the lugs into this 22 millimeter bracelet is um, very aesthetically pleasing or preferable. I'm not here to really tell them that they're wrong, but I will say I kind of disagree. I don't generally prefer a 22 millimeter lug width. While these more thinly tapering lugs do look good, I don't think that they necessarily look better than the Submariner. We'll talk more about that when we bring the Submariner in for comparison purposes. But yeah, overall, this case profile is appealing to a lot of people. I understand why, I just I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it for a number of other reasons. Moving on from the case, however, let's talk about the bezel assembly. Bezel action, excellent. The, the, the knurling or the fluting of the edge of the bezel is outstanding. You get excellent traction. Actuating the bezel is perfectly smooth and just amazing as it is on all Rolex watches. Nobody else in the business does a bezel action better than Rolex in my experience, and I've probably experienced most, if not all of them. It's done very, very well. Very, very impressed with this bezel, but I would 100% expect to be. They're, they're all outstanding in my experience. Now the bezel insert, ceramic or cerachrome as they call it, engraved, the engravings filled with a uh, platinum PVD process filling. Uh, they're very nice as well, but this bezel is fully graduated. As you can see, you have large hash marks here all the way around to the first 15 and little hash marks for each minute all the way around for the remaining 60 minutes. Uh, you have your luminous pip or pearl up at the zero mark area. Yeah, it's, it's a great bezel. I'll probably point it out more when we bring the Submariner in per, for comparison, but it's a wide bezel. The, the width of the insert is much chunkier than the, the Submariner, and we will look at that as well in a few more minutes. Overall though, this bezel is done you know, outstanding, it's flawless, it's perfect, it's Rolex, what can you say? Beyond the ceramic or cerachrome bezel, of course, we have the sapphire crystal with Cyclops magnifier. Cyclops magnifier on this crystal is a point of contention for a lot of people. A lot of people liked that the old sea dwellers did not use a Cyclops. It sort of gave you a non-Cyclops Submariner alternative. If you wanted a Submariner or a Rolex dive watch, but you didn't like the Cyclops magnifier, but you still wanted the date, you had that option in the prior generation Sea Dweller, and uh, that, that option is now gone. A lot of people are upset about that, I guess. I've see, at least seen as much in comments online from people. I like the Cyclops magnifier on Rolex watches, though. It makes the date very readable, and uh, functionality is more important to me than form, at least in this case problems with this crystal, like all Rolex crystals, is there's a lot of glare. They really should consider implementing an anti-reflective coating on their crystals. I wish they would do it sooner rather than later, but they don't, and to the best of my knowledge, they never have. Coming in a little bit closer, let's talk about the Rehot. Inside of the case, above the dial, you can see there is engraved around that edge, Rolex, Rolex, Rolex. The Rehot engraving is a common, um, uh, standard, I guess, for Rolex these days, and of course your serial number would be on the 6 o'clock side. Now a lot of people will notice, uh, let's see if I can get a non-reflective or glaring picture, that there's a little crown up at the 12 o'clock marker on the Rehot engraved there. And as you can see in this particular example, it is misaligned, it looks like it's slightly to the right. I will say that I have never seen a perfectly aligned Rehot in a Rolex dive watch. Never. It's ne I've never seen one. And it's funny because I kind of debated with another YouTube channel, uh, Federico Talks Watches, in his comments. He said he's never seen a misaligned bezel. And I was like, what? How, how is that possible? I've never seen one that's been perfectly aligned. They're all off. Um, so that's been my experience, and it makes me wonder, is this a quality control issue, or does Rolex just simply not care and consider this to be important? Good enough is just, you know, good enough for them. I don't know. 
Uh, but I was surprised to hear <laughs> the other channel, YouTube, uh, Federico Talks Watches, say in his comments to me that he's never seen one misaligned when I have literally never seen one that is aligned. But I don't know that it's necessarily a quality control issue. You can look at pictures on Rolex's website, and in fact, they're misaligned <laughs> on the website. So it might just be that uh, it's just the way it is, and, and frankly, they don't care. However, I do want to point that out, that that is super common to have that misalignment there, to have that little crown not line up dead top center with the 12 o'clock marker. This dial, of course, with a lot of fanfare, brought back the red line of Sea Dweller text. People really like that. You'll also notice that this is a Mark I dial. Down at the bottom it says Swiss Made, and there is not a little Rolex crown between the words Swiss and Made. In the versions that have come out since, uh, in the year 2018 and beyond, they added a little coronet logo between those words. So this is probably a 2017 model. And, um, you know, just keep in mind that you might see versions with and versions without that little coronet logo between the Swiss made printed on the dial there. Other than that, though, the dial is pretty um, straightforward, standard Rolex. All of the branding at the 12 o'clock side is printed. All of the text at the 6 o'clock side is printed. And the printing is pretty good. Uh, Rolex generally does good printing on their dials, though I have seen some exceptions. I have seen quality control issues with the printing on dials as well. But in this particular example, it's done fairly well. The applied markers, which are again filled with chromolite blue luminescence, are white gold applied markers, triangle at the 12, uh, baton sticks at the 6 and 9, and then circles all around at the other positions. And of course a nice little seconds track graduations printed on the outer edge of the dial. The Mercedes style handset is also filled with chromolite luminescence and um, is, of, uh, what am I trying to say here, is manufactured, I guess, of white gold as well. Yeah, overall, it's a fairly typical, straightforward Rolex dial. I like it. I'm a fan of Rolex dials in general, and, you know, this one is no exception. Before we move on to the bracelet, we'll look at the case back. It's one of the few Rolex case backs that has any sort of uh, decoration or engravings, as you can see there. Oyster, Sea Dweller, Original, uh, Gas Escape Valve, got the Coronet logos. That's fairly atypical for Rolex watches. Generally, they don't have any sort of decoration or engraving on the back. One thing to note, though, is just how deeply that case back protrudes off of the back of the mid case and it does make the watch ride very high on the wrist if you're the type of person that likes a watch to be flat and low to the wrist this would not be the version for you but uh, you know i don't find it to be particularly uncomfortable because of that i find that the down downside to this watch is more to do with the overall lug to lug 50 and a half millimeter wingspan that's a little too long for me the, the thickness isn't a big deal the bracelet, uh, oyster style three piece links with nice solid end links, a protruding T shaped end link. Uh, they're done great, nicely machined, very sharp, crisp, crisp edges. The bracelet links do taper fairly dramatically from 22, again, what did I say, down to uh, 17 millimeters at the very base of the bracelet, and then stepping back up to 19 on the clasp. The, the links are, of course, uh, held in with nice screws, 1.6 millimeter screws. A high quality screwdriver would be highly recommended if you're gonna re uh, resize this bracelet yourself. The clasp is an outstanding clasp. It's virtually the same clasp that you find on the Submariner. Fold over safety latch, hinged release, a nice high quality stainless steel, high polished swing arm, and of course, my favorite feature, you have Glide lock, so you can easily adjust this clasp to the size of your wrist without any sort of tools up to 20 millimeters in increments of 2 millimeters. It also has a dive extension, which is another one of these totally useless features. I don't think that people generally are going to need this much of an extension over a wetsuit. People are not uh, diving, generally speaking, with great big thick wetsuits like this. I talked to a dive buddy of mine, as a matter of fact, and he pointed out something interesting. When you get it sized up at the surface, once you're 100 feet or more below the surface, your, your neoprene wetsuit compresses, and now the watch is loose. It's flopping all over. He says that in his experience of going on probably 
dozens, maybe hundreds, I forget the number he told me, of dive trips. He never sees people wearing dive watches like this. It's all dive computers, and uh, features like this really don't add a lot of value to the watch. It's mostly an unnecessary addition in uh, my, my opinion and, you know, my very experienced diver friend's opinion as well. Nevertheless, the bracelet on this watch is outstanding, just like a Rolex Oyster bracelet on a Submariner or a GMT or any other watch. Uh, you know, it's just fantastic. I absolutely love the Oyster bracelets on these watches. So now let's talk about which watch makes for the better Rolex dive watch. Well, first things first, let's talk about the differences, particularly in dimensions, because that's one of the first things that you probably need to understand. Case diameter on the Sea Dweller. Sea Dweller will be on the left, Submariner on the right. 43 millimeters, case diameter on the Submariner, 40 millimeters. Lug width, 22 millimeters on the Sea Dweller, 20 millimeters on the uh, Submariner. The overall thickness of these watches differs pretty significantly. On the Sea Dweller, the thickness comes in at 15.5 millimeters, whereas on the Submariner, the thickness comes in at 12.5 millimeters. And that lug-to-lug -lug distance from one tip of the case to the other, or the watch's wingspan, on the Sea Dweller, the watch on the left, 50.5, on the Submariner, 48 millimeters. Overall, a significantly smaller watch when we, uh, or, or overall presentation or package, when we consider the Submariner uh, preferable, in my opinion. But that's just a personal taste, personal preference. Lots of people are going to disagree with me on that, but I do find the overall size, scale, and dimensions of the Submariner very much preferable to the Sea Dweller. Now, I had mentioned that the Sea Dweller tapers from 22 down to 17 at the clasp and then steps up on the clasp at, to 19 millimeters. The Submariner starts out at 20 millimeters, tapers down to 15 and a half down here, and then steps up to 17 and a half at the clasp. So if we look at these watches side by side, particularly down at the base of the bracelet or the clasps, you can see that the Submariner is much more narrow, significantly noticeably different at both the base of the bracelet and on the clasps. Another big presentation difference is the size of the bezels, in particular the bezel insert. If we look at the Submariner, the bezel insert from edge to edge here, much wider, much bulkier. The overall diameter of the bezel is bigger. It makes the watch present a lot bigger because of how much bigger and beefier that bezel is. I believe that the dial might be a little bit bigger too. Not 100% sure, I didn't measure the dials, but just looking at them, the dial presents a little bit bigger or a little bit more spread out to me than the dial on the Submariner. So you do get the perception of a much bigger watch with the Sea Dweller. And while it is a much bigger watch, you know, it's not like uh, some watches are big, but they wear small. Some watches are small and they wear big. No, this watch is big and it looks big. The biggest difference, or maybe a uh, point of uh, interest for people, is going to be the case shape and the lug dimensions. If we look at the lugs on the Sea Dweller here on the left, we have a more thinly tapered lug, and a lot of people feel like it transitions into the bracelet more elegantly, whereas on the Submariner, it's more of a squared off, thicker, bulkier lug, and then a bigger step over to the 20 millimeter bracelet. I understand why people think that this is more aesthetically pleasing, and in a vacuum, I would probably agree that this might be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, but the overall size and scale and the wearability of this watch for me makes it much less desirable. This Submariner is much more wearable for me and my six and three quarter inch wrist. Again, the personal taste and preference. A lot of people are going to disagree with me. A lot of people are going to find the uh, Sea Dweller, rather, to be extremely wearable and comfortable, despite the fact that it's a relatively large watch. You know, just giving you my perspective on this. Take that for what it is. Another big difference between these two watches is, of course, the movement. The 3235 here in the Sea Dweller, the 3135 here in the Submariner. I've talked about what the 3235 features add, but the big difference that most people are going to make note of is 70 hour power reserve with the Sea Dweller, 48 hour power reserve with the Submariner. Um, I think it's largely irrelevant for most users. Uh, I think 48 hours is probably plenty. And while I would never turn down an extra 
a day or two or three or ten of power reserve, I don't think that it would be a huge purchase decision for me. 48 hours is plenty, but I can appreciate that, yeah, this one does have significantly more power reserve. That's going to be the main tangible difference between these two movements for the average user. I think that potentially service life could be a tangible difference in that maybe because the new 3235 is more efficient, it'll have a longer service life, but I don't know that to be in fact true. I'm sort of speculating that it might have a longer service life and be another tangible difference for the end user. Again, I just can't confirm that as being 100% accurate. I, I don't really know, but I'm going to speculate that that might be the case. So let's answer that question, or try to tackle it anyway. Which of these two watches is the superior, the better Rolex dive watch? I think on paper we could reasonably agree that the Sea Dweller is the technically better dive watch. Much greater depth rating, uh, you know, 1,220 meters versus 300 meters. Um, potentially more technically advanced movement, though I think time will tell whether or not you know it's flawless or not. I'm I'm. I'm expecting it to be, but you know, I, I'm not an early adopter, so I want to add that caveat. But yes, technically on paper, for sure, a more technically advanced movement, um, just you know, overall, theoretically, yeah, a better watch. But which one should you get? I think all of those technical differences are largely not major factors. Nobody needs 300 meters of dive <laughs> depth rating, let alone 1,220 meters. Uh, the movement, I think, again, is going to be largely irrelevant for the average user. 48-hour, 70-hour power reserves, who really cares, probably is the way that most people are going to feel about that. It's ultimately going to boil down to aesthetics. Some people really dislike the squared shoulder lug of the Submariner. Uh, some people are going to dislike the size, the width, and the height of the Sea Dweller. For me, the Submariner is the better watch. Because it's more wearable, it's it's a better everyday timepiece, in my opinion. It's a little bit more low profile, it's a little bit more understated. I think that, again, for me, the Submariner is the better watch for my, my purposes. But ultimately, only you can decide which one is the better one for you. What's best for me is most certainly not going to be what's best for everybody. So yeah, you know, that's my two cents anyway. This watch is not um, sized up for me. There's a lot of extra links in there, so I'm just kind of laying it on the wrist so that you can see what it looks like on my, again, six and three quarter inch uh, wrist. Uh, very, very big. Like, definitely testing the outer limits of my uh, wrist uh, circumference. Very thick, not a huge problem with the thickness. I could deal with that. It's mostly the lug to lug that is just too much for me. And it presents very big. Again, I'd mentioned that larger, thicker, bulkier bezel, maybe a bigger dial. I'm not 100% sure on that as compared to the, uh, the Submariner. 43 millimeter case diameter, wider 22 millimeter lugs. I mean, it just presents significantly larger than the Submariner does on the wrist. It's definitely not a watch for me, I can tell you that much. I would, I'd never add a watch like this to my collection, but I do acknowledge that if you can handle the watch on the wrist, if you like the style, the aesthetic, the scale of the watch, it's a perfectly viable alternative to the Submariner. Despite the fact that the price difference, I don't know if it's necessarily justified. That's another big issue. I didn't, don't think I mentioned it. The Sea Dweller is 11350 The Submariner date is 8550 It's a difference of $2,800. And that $2,800 is going into features that are virtually useless. You know, it's the extra depth rating, that helium escape valve, things like that. Um, the diver's extension, the fold open extension. All of those extra features that you're paying for are features that you'll never use. Uh, you know, so so it makes the, the the Submariner kind of a value by comparison because you're just getting what you need. You're getting a good timepiece that has good water resistance and the glide lock and everything you need and nothing you don't need. Um, so yeah, much better value in the uh, in the Submariner. But I understand a lot of people don't like the aesthetics in particular of the case shape and lugs. So maybe if uh, if you don't care about dropping an extra almost three thousand dollars to get the aesthetic that you like, hey, I can't blame you. 
All right, guys, thanks for tuning in and checking out this review of the Rolex Sea Dweller and the comparison of the Sea Dweller to the Rolex Submariner. To answer that question, which one is the best? Well, it's really gonna boil down to personal taste and preference, primarily, if you ask me. I do think perhaps the Sea Dweller is a technically superior watch on paper, but a lot of those features that make it superior are certainly not necessary for 99.999% of the users. So it's gonna boil down to personal taste, preference, what you like style and aesthetic wise. I do wanna say thanks again to my friends over at Exquisite Timepieces for loaning me this watch. If you guys haven't already checked them out, go to exquisitetimepieces.com and take a look at their website. Give them a call and talk watches with Evan or anyone else over at the shop. Big thanks again, guys. I appreciate you loaning me this watch. Thanks for tuning in as always. And if you'd like to help support the channel, down in the description of this video, a number of ways that you can do that. First and foremost, follow me on my social media accounts, please. I'd really appreciate it. I need more support over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you'd like to help support the channel financially, you can become a Patreon supporter. I have a link to Patreon down below. Big thanks to the guys that have been supporting me on Patreon. I greatly appreciate it. Finally, if you want to help support me financially, but you don't want to spend any extra money of your own, you can do all of your Amazon shopping like you normally would, but click on my affiliate link first. For example, if you like something that I've reviewed and you're thinking about buying it, click on my Amazon affiliate link found in the description of this and every video that I do, and I get a small commission for each and every transaction that goes through that link. Those Transactions or commissions, I guess I should say, do add up and a very big thanks to everyone that has been using that affiliate link. I do greatly appreciate it. Well, that's gonna wrap this one up for today. So until the next one, I'll say bye now.